Welcome to Ephraim Slide Assembly. The following podcast is from our teaching series on Genesis. It is December the 16th, 2023. My name is Doris Smith, announcer and member of the ministry team here at Ephraim Slide Assembly. You will want to do two things as you prepare to study with us. First, Read the text for today's message, which is Genesis chapter 41, verse 1, to Genesis chapter 44, verse 17. Secondly, you will want to have paper and pen so that you can take notes. We also suggest you use this teaching as a Bible study for you and your family. This week's portion of Scripture is called Bikeds, in Hebrew, which means at the end. You will not want to miss a minute of this teaching. It is the Sabbath and God is pleased that we are studying his word. Now let us join our Pastor Frank Smith with this week's teaching entitled, Assimilating into His Likeness. I want to start off today by telling you how important our Jewish heritage is. Without the southern tribe of Israel, Judah, we wouldn't have a Bible. Let me put it another way. There are no Gentile authors in the Bible. All the authors of the Bible were Jewish, but not all were Jews, meaning from the tribe of Judah. For instance, Moses was a Levite, not from the house of Judah. Paul was an Israelite of the seed of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. Technically, Paul was not a Jew, but a Benjamite. Paul, in some of the ancient writings, said that his mission was to win over those who had no law, meaning teaching and instruction, winning them over to Christ so they could be grafted into Israel. He also said, for the sake of Christ, I am whatever I need to be. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 10. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake. Folks, there's not a person in our ministry that's not expressed a regret that they were not raised in the Torah. But in our way, our lives are more exciting and fulfilled because God has seen fit to bring us through Christ Jesus to the Torah and have the Spirit of Yeshua be our Torah coach. He's daily moving us away from all the theories and myths of man-made religion. Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 38, And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Clearly, what is represented in the cross is following God's instructions in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, which has all the commandments of God in it. There are no new commandments in the New Testament. They are all in the first five books of the Bible. In the story of Joseph we are studying now, you may remember that Joseph landed in prison because he would not succumb to the advances of Potiphar's wife, which led her, out of spite, to lie about the incident, which was instigated by her own lust and Joseph ended up in prison. The principle here is that Joseph was living a principle of God when he refused her advances. Now, we cannot be sure how long Joseph was in prison, but it's believed to be between 10 and 12 years. During that time, he was promoted to a servant of the captain of the guard. A butler and a cupbearer from Pharaoh's staff were thrown into prison with Joseph, which set this up. They had dreams which Joseph interpreted, and the interpretations came true. Per the dream, one was hanged and the other returned to Pharaoh's service with the promise he would not forget Joseph. He did forget until two years later when the Pharaoh had a dream that no one could interpret. Here is Pharaoh's dream from Genesis 41, verses 1 through 7. The Pharaoh was standing beside the Nile River, and there came up out of the river seven cows, sleek and fat, and they began feeding in the swamp grass. After them, there came up out of the river seven more cows, 
miserable looking and lean, and they stood by the other cows at the edge of the river. Then the miserable looking and lean cows ate up the seven sleek fat cows. At this point, Pharaoh woke up, but he went to sleep again and dreamt a second time seven full ripe ears of grain grew out of a single stalk. After them, seven ears, thin and blasted by the east wind, sprung up. And then the thin ears swallowed up the seven full ripe ears. Then Pharaoh woke up and realized it had been a dream. Now, as the leader of a country, Pharaoh was upset about the dream, which was really two dreams, and he called in all of his magicians and wise men and all of those people who surrounded him, but none could interpret the dream for Pharaoh. Now, the principle here is, why did God give Pharaoh two dreams that were similar? And the answer is, God gives things in duplicate to confirm a matter. Listen to Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. One witness alone will not be sufficient to convict a person of any offense or sin of any kind. The matter will be established only if there are two or three witnesses testifying against him. You'll also find it in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1. Now, the backstory actually, according to the Midrash, all those who were called before Pharaoh conjured up a story and they gave it to Pharaoh in order to save their skins, but their interpretation was not one that Pharaoh felt right about. So Pharaoh was looking for others to interpret the dream. He was in a tizzy, didn't know what to do. At that time, the butler related Joseph's ability to interpret dreams to the Pharaoh, and Pharaoh immediately summoned Joseph from prison. Now the butler said this, you'll find this in the scripture, one night, both I and a baker had dreams, and each man's dream had its own meaning. There was with us a young man, a Hebrew, a servant of the captain of the guard, and we told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us. He interpreted each man's dream individually, and it came about as he interpreted it to us. I was restored to my office, and he was hanged. Now, let's remember Joseph's first job at Potiphar's house. Joseph was promoted to head of all the servants because Potiphar recognized that Joseph had wisdom. What was Potiphar's job? He was Pharaoh's captain of the guard. Potiphar is the same man then that made Joseph his assistant in the prison. Now this tells us Potiphar probably didn't believe his wife's story about Joseph, but was forced to act upon it. So at the time, Joseph was about 30 years of age. So they cleaned him up, they shaved him and decorated him with clean clothes and brought him out of the pit, the prison, to appear before Pharaoh. And you may remember Joseph's brothers taking clothes from him. Now he gets his clothing back. The brothers put Joseph in a pit of death and now Joseph arises from the prison, a pit of death. The brothers saw him coming with evil intent. Now the Pharaoh of Egypt has ordered his coming with anticipation. By the providence of God, folks, Joseph's fortunes were being reversed. You're going to find that a common theme in this section. In fact, the principle here is the whole theme in this section is that God reverses curses and restores those who love him and pass the test that he allows to come to them. Genesis 41, 15 and 16. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and there's no one who can interpret it, but I've heard it said about you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it isn't me. God will give Pharaoh an answer that will set his mind at peace. So now just to let you know, as we interpret scripture, you will find that we're always seeing the Hebrew way, and that is in parallels. We draw parallels from the Holy Scripture, sometimes I call them types and shadows, just as Yeshua did. Now Yeshua is salvation, and he came to us lowly, meek like Moses, 
and described as riding on an animal that was known to be hardworking, attached, and dedicated to its master, an animal of slowness. Now, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 is Christ's first coming where he reversed sin and death. Listen to it. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king comes to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding it upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, Zechariah 9, verse 12 describes his future coming where sin and death are destroyed. It says, Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore you double. Now here's the principle. We are at the end of the sixth day in God's 7,000-year plan of redemption, and God is pouring out His wisdom, and those who are obeying His instructions are gathering a double portion, like the good virgins who gathered up a double portion of oil preparing for the lean years to come in Yeshua's parable of the ten virgins. Like Joseph gathering a double portion of wheat so that Egypt and the Israelites could survive the lean years. You see, when the lean years come, those who sit through 18-minute sermons with two jokes and a few secular quotes and a short explanation, and those who ignore the Word of God completely will search for answers but not find them, for they have not learned the principles of God. Those with the wisdom of God are right now gathering an ample supply of the good oil of the Word of God, the study of Torah. When the darkness and the famine come, their lamps will be trimmed and ready. They will make it through the tribulation while others are fainting. Joel chapter 2, verses 25 through 26. It says, The enemy has sent grasshoppers, shearer worms, and cutter worms, his tools of deception and destruction. But for those who obey God, he will restore them. It says in Joel 2, 25 through 26, I will restore to you the years the locust ate, the grasshoppers, the shearer worms, and the cutter worms, my great army that I sent against you. You will eat until you are satisfied and will praise the name of Adonai your God who has done with you such wonders. Then my people will never again be ashamed. The principle here, God is the reverser of curses, the life giver, the gift giver, our creator, the one who deals wondrously with those who respond to his instructions. In the old days, they didn't know so much about Satan. So if you did not know about Satan and his devices, where would you think all these things were coming from? You would believe, just as they believed, that both good and bad was coming from God. In our age, we know the difference. So when we read our Bible, we must define and separate the deeds of our good God and the deeds of destruction from Hasatan. Having to appease an angry God is a pagan thought process. Satan is only mentioned three times in the Old Testament, and they are in passages written after 1000 B.C. We must be careful what kind of image we create in our minds about God, for whatever image we calculate in our minds, that is the image we'll gravitate toward. With a wrong view, we can become like Islam, thinking that God is a hateful, vengeful, wrathful, punishing God that deals harshly with the sinner and the infidel, and therefore those who have this image of God become destroyers and killers. It opens a portal within a person to rape, kill, destroy, and take the life of babies in and out of the womb. People without a correct image of God become like the abortionists, like Hamas and Hezbollah. Students in our colleges have been brainwashed and indoctrinated with false gods. Principle, our American culture has got a wrong view of God that's come about through the false teachings of the church and the leanings of a culture without the Lord. We are becoming like the God we imagine, not the one who created us in love. False teaching brings false images, but through Yeshua, we see God in His true form and we realize 
He is a life-giving creator, not a life-taking creator. He is love, life, light, and the one who pursues us with his instructions. He is totally selfless. Pastors concentrate on great oratory that keep people entertained, manipulating their minds, but ignoring the principles we're to live by. It's no wonder we find ourselves in opposition to the instructions of God and face a very unstable and destructive future in this country. America must have a revival in the Torah and to living the Torah lifestyle if it is to survive. In the future, those who follow the Torah will be cast as people have done something wrong, may be arrested and put into prison, but who will stand with the instructions of God? Yeshua is the Word of God, the living Torah, the instructions of God. Listen to Luke 12, verses 10 through 15. Then he told them, Peoples will fight each other, nations will fight each other. There will be great earthquakes, there will be epidemics and famines in various places, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. But before all of this, they will arrest you and persecute you, handing you over to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors. This all will be on account of me, but it will prove an opportunity for you to bear witness. So make up your minds not to worry, rehearsing your defense beforehand, for I myself will give you an eloquence and a wisdom that no adversary will be able to resist or refute. In Matthew 10, 22, Everyone will hate you because of me, Jesus said, but whoever holds out till the end will be preserved from harm. Woe be to those who begin to study the Torah and quit. It will be only those who hold out to the end that will be preserved from harm. When Job was experiencing all of these things, instead of defending himself, what did he do? He humbled himself. He sought God and he prayed for those persecuting him, his so-called friends. Job's focus got outside of himself and he sought God's wisdom on why these things were happening to him. His friends maintained that he must have done something wrong for these things to happen to him. Even his wife said, curse God and die and end your misery. But Job never changed his love for the Lord and his acknowledgement of God's love for him. He was steadfast. He never wavered. And God gave him a double portion blessing in the end. Go read that story in Job chapter 42. Matthew 5 verse 44. Pray for those who persecute you and despitefully use you. Now the principle here is, God does not bring evil to anyone, but he allows the enemy to test us. If you can die to yourself, God will raise you to places that you yourself could never get to with all of your self-exaltation and energies. Our job, folks, is to humble ourselves and relent to God and how he would use us. God is doing a work in us to restore the whole house of Israel. But folks, it's a process. We must go through the test to come. We must not skip any of them by being raptured to another world. Revelation 3 verse 21. To him who overcomes, Jesus said, I will grant the right to sit with me in my throne. In our story today, God gave grace and wisdom to Joseph to interpret the Pharaoh's dreams, and Joseph gave all the credit to God so that God would be glorified. The seven good years and the seven lean years of famine were fixed by God. Joseph advised Pharaoh to find a man who was both discreet and wise to put in charge of the land of Egypt to manage against what God was bringing. Principle here. Store the Torah in your heart against that day when a famine of the word will come. 2 Timothy 1 verse 12. For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Joseph realized that the tenth of the produce taken to the temple was to sustain the priest and that if Egypt was to survive the famine, 
another tenth must be added for the purpose of survival. This is the principle of the double tithe that many churches use from time to time to fund additional and special projects. Now the Pharaoh saw in Joseph wisdom, and the wise in the world will see God's wisdom in those who study the Torah and live by it. God has dispersed us among the nations to be a blessing to those nations, not just to live comfortably and depend on others, which is the mantra of religion. In Genesis chapter 41, verses 39 through 41, we see that Pharaoh placed Joseph in charge of the entire nation of Egypt. He even took his signet ring off his hand and he put it on Joseph's hand. And that meant that Joseph could enact laws. Pharaoh clothed him in fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck and had him ride in his second best chariot. Joseph went from walking 65 miles to see his brothers and be thrown into a pit to riding in luxury. There is a famine coming, folks. It's coming to the whole world in the near future. One of bread, shown in Revelation 6, verses 7 through 8, in which the, during the fourth sealed judgment, 25% of the earth's inhabitants will die from wars, hunger, disease, and wild beasts. I hope you heard that, 25%, one quarter of the earth's inhabitants will die. That's scripture. The second one is spiritual. It's a famine of the word of God. Amos 8, 11 through 13. The time is coming, says Adonai Elohim, when I will send famine over the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of Adonai. People will stagger from sea to sea and from north to east, running back and forth, seeking the word of Adonai, but they will not find it. When that time comes, young women and men will faint from thirst. What is more important, feeding our body or feeding our true identity, which is the spirit of God within us? The spirit of God can only be fed by the word of God. Now, Yeshua said in Matthew 4, verse 4, It is written, and forever remains written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. The principle here is, there will come a day when the Spirit of God will not provide spiritual food to sustain spiritual life. There will be no oil for our lamps, as the parable of Jesus illustrates. Now is the time for the Word of God to be written and hidden in our hearts. If we learn the Torah of God and begin to live it out in our lives, we will no longer need the scrolls or the Bible when a famine of the Word comes. Those who have prepared will be able to keep their lamps lit, while those who have no oil for their lamps will be in outer darkness that will cause them to to faint. Torah keepers will have the opportunity to be a blessing to this world. The false religious system is setting a trap, especially for the Pentecostals and the New Age worshipers. They want you to depend on the church for a new high of emotion in worship every week, to speak in tongues and depend on music. This is false seed that will not produce anything but seeds of emotion. But for those who have and live the 613 Torah principles, they have the seed that will produce again and again. We need Yeshua to feed our souls, not all the wind dressings of religion. If we have Torah principles, we have Yeshua. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 verses 2 through 5, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries, but he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets 
that the church may receive edification. Are we to be pleasing ourselves or are we to be building up others? Paul does not find fault with strengthening ourselves in our relationship with God, but God is selfless and our focus should be on building others up with the Torah, not satisfying ourselves with tongues. When the famine of the word and the spirit of God comes, we'll speak it in tongues. Do you or anyone else any good? But if you have the seed of the principles of God from the Torah in you, and they are your lifestyle, can you feed those around you who hunger? Yes. Principle. Now is the time when God has lifted the veil to the Torah and is calling those who love him to stock up and store the knowledge of the Torah before the famine of the word. He who stores up treasures now will not hunger and thirst after righteousness, but will have the principles of the Torah, the constitution of God to live by. Those will be the ones in the bridal chamber for the wedding of the Lamb. Think about it. It's all about what seed is in you. Is the seed in your music, tongues, and emotional experiences, religion that goes along with the world, or is the seed of the Lord, the Torah, His instructions in you? In third world countries, farmers have been harvesting their crops year after year and saving the seed for the next year for centuries. Now the World Health Organization is giving them hibernized seed that will not reproduce, telling them it's better because it's more disease resistant and healthier. This is nothing more than making the independent dependent on Monsanto and the others to buy seed from them in the future. Now those who are self-existent will be dependent on the new world order for seed to produce food. That means control. Religion is doing the same thing. Those without Torah will turn to religion to help them when the famine comes and will become dependent on the one world government and take the mark of the beast. Those who depend on God will be protected by God. In Revelation chapter 17, we find the beast comes out of the bottomless pit. There's a woman riding on the beast. The woman is the corrupt religious system that devours the woman in Revelation 17, verse 16. Folks, God has never authorized his church to unite with civil powers to agree with abortion, homosexuality, prostitution, and child trafficking. It's religion that causes them to remain silent on these issues in standing with the wokeness of the world. God loves those who are participating in these things, and he calls them back to a pure lifestyle before they are separated from him forever. Rather than staying on God's Torah principles, religion remains silent when they should be sowing the seeds of the Torah into those who are far off from God. The church must start sowing seed that will reproduce. Relationship with God is of pure love, he has always respected our freedom of action. Principle, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was in the Garden of Eden because God allowed us to choose. It provided a way to reject God, to tell him no. Without it, our yes would not be a choice. He is God, the creator, who can be trusted for eternity. In contrast, the Antichrist, the one world government, is about enslaving you and not giving you a choice. Folks, listen to me. If your religious organization is not teaching the Torah, the good seed of God, you may be reluctant to leave, but if you're going to survive the darkness to come, you must get somewhere to get oil for your lamp. You're being tested. If you want oil, the Torah, you will be obeying God because you love him and want to know and obey his instructions. This is a test of where your heart is. Without delay, get God's good seed that reproduces, which is Torah commandments. They will reproduce, but the seed of religion will not. When the famine comes, will you be sustainable in God's word or hungry enough to follow the one world government? Will you be a beggar or one who is blessed? 
Will you give your heart totally to God by learning and obeying his Torah instructions? Or will you take the mark of the beast and sell out to the world government that will enslave you? We may be in the time of abundance now, but soon the years of famine will come. So parallel with our story, Joseph was raised up to be the commander of Egypt. He was given a new name, Zapanath Panea, and he was given a wife. Now in the Bible, not a whole lot is known about this wife, only that her name was Osnot or Ashenoth, depending on whether it's pronounced from an Egyptian or Hebrew perspective. Her name in Egyptian means belonging to God. She was the daughter of Potipera and Potiphera, the priest of On, known today as Onika Mimali. He led the worship of the Egyptian sun god in his providence, but don't let that mislead you. Joseph did not sin in marrying her. Why? Here's the backstory from the Midrash. Pagan priests were eunuchs, and it is said that his wife was barren, unable to to become pregnant. Osnot in Hebrew means thorn bush, so why did his daughter have that name? Dina, Jacob's daughter, was raped by Shechem and became pregnant and had a daughter. Jacob knew that this daughter would be looked down upon all of her life, so upon the passing of Dina, when Joseph was kidnapped, he took this child out and put her under a thorn bush with a little plate around her neck that had the holy name of God on it. He prayed that God would take care of this child, and it is said that Michael the archangel took the little child to Egypt to Potiphar's house, and this barren couple raised her as their own daughter. It is said that Joseph, being handsome and the most eligible bachelor in Egypt, would have women throw gifts at him as he rode the streets of Egypt. This girl, now a woman, threw the plate with the inscription of yud heh vah on it at Joseph. Joseph was concentrating on the work of the Lord, but that little plate with God's name on it got his attention. God pointed it out to Joseph, and Joseph knew that she was the one that God preserved for him. And that is how Joseph and Dina's daughter, a Hebrew, met and married. And you can find this story from the Midrash at Shabbat at Shabbat.org by searching her name, Oshnat, O-S-N-A-T. Now, she and Joseph had two children before the famine came. First, Manasseh, meaning to forget, because God made Joseph forget all of his misfortunes. And then Ephraim, meaning fruitful, because God caused Joseph to be fruitful in the land of his affliction. Now, in a contrast of names and history, Judah means praise or thankfulness to God. Manasseh means forgotten. Which tribe left Israel to never return and during times of persecution were assimilated into the nations and into Christianity and Islam? The answer, Manasseh, who forgot the ways of God, their heritage, and the Torah. Manasseh and Ephraim have been in foreign lands and forgot the Father's name, the rules of the house of Israel, and the Ketubah covenant. Now, out of all these people from Manasseh and Ephraim, most see no reason to return to their roots, God's instructions in righteousness, and how to draw near to God. There is only a remnant that are realizing their covenant with God. So which tribe was charged with keeping the Torah and preserving it? the tribe of Judah. Now, Judah may have wavered a few times, but they have preserved the Torah and have kept true to the Ketubah covenant of God. That leaves the second-born Ephraim. Ephraim got the first-born blessing from Jacob, who adopted his two grandchildren, Ephraim and Manasseh. He got the double portion when Jacob told Reuben in Genesis 9, 1 through 4, that he would not have preeminence and he gave Ephraim Reuben's blessing. Now that meant that Ephraim got a double blessing. This was because of Reuben's sex sin committed with his stepmother Bela and the defilement of his father's bed. 
So in Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 13, we find that Reuben got an equal portion of the physical wealth of Jacob, just as much as Ephraim and Manasseh. But he didn't get the spiritual blessing. In Revelation 7, verse 5, which describes the 12,000 from each of the tribes that will take the Torah to all the earth, Judah is listed first, then Reuben. Now Ephraim is the good tree and receives the double portion. Why? He forgot just like Manasseh. He assimilated just like Manasseh. So why did he get the double portion? Because prophecy tells us that Ephraim is the one who will wake up and return to the Torah in the last days. John referred to Ephraim in Revelation 4, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now here's the principle. As we've always said, you must have the faith of Jesus, not faith in Jesus. This is the difference between Christianity and those returning to the covenant roots of their faith. Ephraimites are the one returning to the Torah as their lifestyle and who have the testimony of Yeshua as Savior and future Messiah on their lips and in their heart. These are the double portion, Torah lifestyle and Yeshua as Savior. If you find yourself drawn to Torah study with Jesus as your mainstay, you are Ephraim. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 17, If you love me, obey my commandments. If you love me, Torah. If you love me, study the Torah. If you love me, live the Torah. Mark 7, verses 20 through 23, and Proverbs 4, verse 23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Principle. Whatever you have in your heart, that is what will come across your lips, and whether it be your choice to obey Yeshua or serve up evil. Yes, Lord, you're putting it together for us. Manasseh and some of the Christians will come later. They will hold on to their testimony of Yeshua, but will not see him as the Torah. Likewise, Judah will keep the Torah, but not recognize Yeshua. But Ephraim is the one blessed with the double portion, the Torah of God and Yeshua. The prophecy is that Ephraim will be the catalyst in the hands of God to bring the two houses together. As prophesied by Ezekiel at the instruction of the Lord, Ephraim and Judah will be reunited and never be apart again. Just as Joseph prophesied a severe famine would come across the earth and people would be looking for food, God has predicted a famine for the word of God in our day. Joseph made Egypt ready for this famine. God is now offering us an understanding of his Torah in preparation for the famine of the word to come. Now, the famine in Joseph's time began to affect Jacob and his sons in Israel, and Jacob, in the second year of the famine, found out that there was grain in Egypt, and he sent all of Joseph's brothers except Benjamin to buy some grain. And we know that Joseph was the overseer of all the grain in Egypt, so his brothers, who did not recognize him, bowed down to him. But Joseph recognized them. Joseph remembered the dreams he had about them. Joseph's first dream of the sheaves bowing down to him had come to pass. So he said in Genesis 42, verse 8, You are spies. You've come to see the nakedness of the land, to look over our country's weaknesses. In verses 10 through 13, And they said to him, No, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We all are one man's sons. We are honest men, your servants, and not spies. But Joseph said to them, No, but you've come to see the nakedness of the land. And his brothers said, Your servants are twelve brothers, the son of one man in the land of Canaan, and in fact the youngest is with our father today, and one is no more. Of course, they were talking about Joseph's supposed death. 
Now in verses 14 through 24, but Joseph said to them, it is as I speak to you saying you're spies. In this manner you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh you shall not leave this place until your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother and you shall be kept in prison that your words may be tested to see whether there's any truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh surely you're spies. So he put them all together in prison three days. Then Joseph said to them the third day, Do this and live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house, but you go and carry grain for the famine of your houses and bring your youngest brother to me so your words will be verified and you shall not die. And they did so. Then they said to one another, We are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear. Therefore this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not speak to you, saying, Don't sin against the boy, and you would have not listened? Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them in Egyptian through an interpreter. Now Joseph was dressed in the garb of an Egyptian and spoke Egyptian to them through an interpreter so that they wouldn't recognize him. Now the principle behind all this is those who are being obedient to the call of God and returning to his pathways are disguised in the pagan garb of false beliefs in the false teachings and myths of religion, which is a foreign language to our brother Judah, yet we expect our brother Judah to recognize us as Israel. They cannot, because we've not spoken the language of the Torah. But as the pagan guard comes off, and we honor and obey the Torah, and we begin to speak it, Judah will begin to recognize us as his brother Ephraim. Colossians 3, verse 10. You have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Mark 7, verse 24. And then Joseph turned himself away from them and wept. Then he returned to them again and he talked with them. And he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Their confession and their contrite heart brought tears to Joseph's eyes. The brothers left Simeon in prison. Joseph had their packs filled with grain and they left. Their first night that they camped, one of them found the money for the grain in his pack and declared to the rest that their money had been restored to them. Ladies and gentlemen, our Lord is in the restoration business, not the destruction business. However, the brothers were afraid that this was a trap in the way that they would be recompensed for their sin against Joseph. If they were caught and charged as thieves, they would be put to death. But instead of taking the money back right away, a selfless love had taken over in their hearts. They figured if we're going to die, that we just got to take the food to our father first, so at least he and his household could live. And of course, they arrived home and explained everything to their father. As you read the rest of this week's scripture portion, you will see that Jacob eventually sent his boys back to get more food, complying with demands that Joseph had made. Although there are many more symbols and lessons here, we'll finish this session by talking about the silver cup that Joseph had placed in the grain sack of Benjamin as they tried to leave Egypt the second time, and that resulted in their arrest and return to Egypt. They were brought back to Joseph and bowed down to him a second time. Remember the second dream? Ultimately, Joseph took off his Egyptian garb and they recognized him. So let's talk for a moment about the cup. Psalm 16, verses 5 through 8, David says, Yeshua is our cup. It says, O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. 
you maintain my lot. What was David saying? He was saying, Adonai, you are my portion. You safeguard my share because we all have an inheritance in Israel. In the 23rd Psalm, David said, my cup runneth over. We'll be given as an inheritance a place in the house of Israel and in the land of Israel in which to live. The Torah is our ketubah covenant with God. Psalm 16, verse 7, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. And it reminds us of Isaiah 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So Joseph here is the wise counselor in the likeness, I call it the type and shadow of Yeshua. In Matthew 26, verses 64 and 65, Jesus had just been accused of blasphemy for being called the Son of God. He answered the high priest accusations with these words. It is as you said, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. So in this week's portion, Benjamin is the likeness of Yeshua ascending to the right hand of the Father. Israel called him the son of my right hand. They found the cup, which represents Yeshua, and the cup is found in the grain sack of the son of my right hand. And the high priest tore his clothes just like the brothers tore their clothes. You see, the priest thought that because Jesus called himself the Son of God, they thought he was putting himself in the place of God like pagan worship had done. Even the Trinity, folks, is a pagan concept to a Hebrew, for the Hebrew knows there is only one God, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. The principle, our soul, God in us, is our true identity. Do not worry about people accusing you for they are living in the flesh and we know our true identity, the Spirit of God that lives in us. It is through the blood of the Lamb and living His teaching and instruction that we are justified and sanctified. Shabbat Shalom.